Good morning, everyone. Today is the April 26th, and this is the Friday meeting of the Elementary School Building Committee. Seeing we have a quorum, I'm calling the meeting to order. Um, we're missing a few members that I think will be joining, but I will call on everyone who is here to make sure they can <laughs> hear and be heard. Um, Paul. Present. Jennifer. Yes. Doug. Yes. Uh, Jonathan. Good morning. Good morning, Bruce. Present. Elisha Walker. Here. And I, I think this may be the first meeting that Bruce has been officially part of the full committee. I know he came to design subcommittee, so I want to welcome Bruce Caldum to our our group. Thank you, Bruce. So I'm turning it over to uh, Margaret with the agenda. Kathy, this is Rupert. I'm here. Oh, Rupert. I'm sorry, Rupert. Yeah, this is the, sorry, you are listening to the faceless voice. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. I Thank you, Rupert. And it looks like Deb Leonard is joining us. All right. And oh, good. And the agenda is coming right now okay. as a PDF to you. Thank you. And Deb, no Deb, can you he, can you just let us know that you can hear and we can hear you? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. And the, pic, the picture that's showing is you and your family, but that's okay for now. It's we we know you're Sorry. here. That's okay. Thank it's you. not a problem. And Allison okay. Essie has confirmed she can attend. So it's possible Tammy may join us, but we're at least we're set to ready okay. to go. So right. I'm going to pull up the agenda and we will get launched. As I was saying earlier, the mm -hmm. meeting invite is for a um, couple of hours, but I think this will be a fairly brief meeting. So the goal would be to get done in something closer to an hour. So um, if everybody can see the agenda, you can see I'm going to do my standard schedule overview, which will include a comment about permitting. Um, the most interesting thing will be the design subcommittee update um, from our last meeting. Um, Rick, um, I'm going to ask you to sort of talk about the long lead item issue, which has been discussed earlier. We do have invoices which do require your vote, so please hang on for those. And then um, we'll have public comment. So that is the agenda. Does anyone have any questions before we? Move on to the next item. Okay. Well, then I'm going to share a different screen and do my schedule overview. All righty. So here we go. So um, this is a little bit, you know, typically I've been looking, sh sharing with this with you, looking at three months, but I kind of shrunk it a bit in order to be able to show you four months because the, the thing that is sort of, in, on, in the offing now um, is the receiving bids uh, from the GCs. So um, we're gonna um, sort of put a pin in that because that's where all the activity that we're, the rest of the schedule reflects is heading towards. So, you know, just as a reminder, we're here. Um, uh, this is, here's today's meeting, um, school vacation, uh, went off last week with the temp traffic signals being installed. And um, I think we've got a working system. Um, we have a meeting May 17th, a meeting June 14th. Uh, no, sorry, the last day of school is June 14th. Then we have an ESBC meeting June 21st, um, an ESBC meeting July, 7, July 19th, and then a meeting in August. Um, the consultant team has been incredibly busy the last month or so because today we're sending the 90%, they are sending the 90% uh, construction documents to the cost estimators for the final estimate that will occur before the bidding. So um, this is actually supposed to say 100%. Um, <clears throat> So there, we're going to start the cost estimates uh, 
the that gun is shooting going off today, we'll be doing the cost estimate reconciliation on May 15th. Um, there is a Friday ESBC meeting, so we anticipate being able to report to you on the estimates that time. And then right after that, we have to, as a team, make the 90% CD submission to the MSBA. The MSBA starts their review of documents. They have a timeline for getting their documents back. The document, the comments get incorporated in the MSBA. Um, then we, there's a final submission to the MSBA after the bids are posted. There's a lead update that has to go to the USGBC. And then um, at that point, um, sometime in late August, we will also need, uh, it could be sooner than that, but not later, we will need to confirm the playground surfacing with CONCOM. So I want to pause just a moment and say that um, although um, we haven't seen the minutes yet, we did receive a notice um, from Maria Kapicki that there there was uh, that the CONCOM um, did take up the um, uh, the issue of playground surfacing at their March 13th meeting. Well, I don't have those minutes yet, but essentially they took a vote against the use of um, any playground surfacing that used um, rubber, uh, the kind of rubber that's in the port in place rubber. And they listed uh, a series of other options that were acceptable to them. Uh, and um, Corkeen was at the top of that list. So for the purposes of the discussion here, um, the uh, Corkeen is what is in the construction document and in, in the construct the 90% CD set that's being estimated. So we'll have some feedback on that. As I've mentioned before, it's tough to get pricing on that um, right now. Uh, so we'll see what that looks like. Well, we will be able to update you on that um, at the May 17th meeting. And um, hopefully we'll also have uh, the minutes from the CONCOM meeting to circulate. So there's also a lot going on on procurement. Um, uh, the week of April 17th, we received the pre-qualification packages from the filed sub bidders and the general contractors. We got a very good response and we're in the process of reviewing them. The, the one comment um, I'll make is that um, we didn't get any elevator pre-qualifications. That's what's called elevators or what's called a filed subbid. We never do. <laughs> so there's a sort of standard process that we have to go through of re-advertising it. And if on the second re-advertisement, we don't get qualifications, we can assign that uh, scope of work to the general contractors for the purposes of bidding. So that's a bit of a sort of standard uh, bureaucratic process that the team is going through. Um, the latest we expect to be notifying qualified bidders is um, mid-June. Um, right around that time, we're also going to be, we've been working with the town's uh, insurance broker to develop costs for what's called builder's risk insurance, which is insurance that the town carries on um, work that's been put in place by the contractor. So it's, you know, if there was a, a storm, for instance, that caused damage to part of the building that was already installed, that's what the builder's risk covers. So it's an important component. Um, we can't finalize it until we, we know for sure who the GC bidder is, but um, they're going to get, um, they're going to be asking for uh, estimates in the meantime. Bid documents will get posted in early July. The first step is the receipt of filed sub bids. We right now we tentatively have the GC bids due um, August seventh, and then we would expect the general contractor, the selected general contractor, to be mobilizing on site towards the end of August. Um, I'm going to turn this over on construction meetings. I want Ksenia just to give a quick update on how the early site package is going. Sure, thank you. Just pull up my screen. Here we go. Oops. Can everybody see that? 
Yeah. So we are now in this traffic pattern. This drawing hasn't changed in ages. Um, it's going to stay in place um, all during the construction of a new school until we have a major uh, phase shift to occupy the new school and start taking down the old school. The only thing remaining to be done is there are some temporary traffic lights installed at the top north driveway. Um, they are able to flash, but not yet programmed to do the green, red, normal operation. That's getting done shortly, and that will replace the need uh, for a traffic officer. Um, the construction inside the fence um, looks something like this. I've got a few pictures to show you. Um, over the last few weeks, the topsoil has been stripped away and stockpiled. Uh, new material has begun being brought to site and spread out and compacted in layers. Um, this will create the overburden uh, that will allow the ground to settle over time. Um, it does require is, is going to require some time, uh, but as they start on one side of a site and progress to another, the early part of a site will be ready before the late site for the later part of a site and uh, installing the next activity after that or in conjunction with this will be installing deep ground improvements, rammed aggregate piers. Um, and basically from the perspective of a public, what's going on inside the fence is going to look much like this for a foreseeable future. Any questions? Not too much to it. That's great, Ksenia. So any questions on the schedule before we turn to the um, design committee update from Denisco? Uh, Margaret, I don't have a question, but if you could send us all of that by email and then I will post it as well. And yep. I see Rupert's hand is up. Rupert, go ahead. I, excuse me, I just had a minor correction. I think the last day of school is now June 20th on your schedule. Oh, thank you, Rupert. I, yeah, I was going off of what I was finding online. So um, that's, I will correct that. And Doug, am I right that the first, your first day of school will be August 29th, which is the, I think it's the Thursday before the Labor Day weekend? No, it's actually the 20th. It's the Monday of that week. Okay. I'll correct that too. And Margaret, the teachers arrive earlier. Um, we got that information from Tammy. Yeah, so the I'll teachers share. arrive the 22nd and and uh, the Thursday before the 22nd. Yeah. So Joe, I have one question looking forward. Um, when, when they come to do the ground source wells uh, for the ground source heat pumps. Um, you'll have a schedule for when that will be. And I'm asking mainly because my understanding when you masked it, it, they allowed surrounding areas to know what was going on. And it looks like it'll be while well, school's in session um, or will it be able to, uh, you know, what giving the bidding cycle when when that comes in. So it's just a timing and making sure we uh, let the school folks know that as well. So I don't need an answer right now, but um, just in, that's not part of the early site package. I know that, yeah. And Tim, I, I don't really need an answer right now. I just was thinking it would be good maybe when we meet in May, you know, to get sort of a sense and make sure that Tammy and everyone in the school system knows that that piece of it. Um, so Rick, maybe maybe you could just quickly address that, Rick, or, or I can. Um, the ground source heat pump well drilling will really be dictated by the general contractor. Um, so we can't tell them when to do it. Uh, it. It probably will occur during school session. It will take several months to drill. 
um, and by the time they mobilize, et cetera. Um, but, but Rick, we'll have a no. better sense once the contractor's on board, what their schedule right. is, When the right? contractor's on board, they give us an overall uh, schedule fairly soon. And, and that's when we'll be able to let everybody know in general what's going on. But it ties up a big portion of the site. And as Donna noted, it it takes a few weeks and uh, it's basically means and methods and will be up to the general contractor to schedule that work as best he can around his own operations, swinging steel, et cetera. Okay, thank you. And I, I see that Tammy has just joined us and when she's back on the screen. Hi, Tammy. Just if you let us know whether you can hear us so we can hear you. Yes, I can. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Tammy. Thank you. Okay. I think we're willing, to, ready to go to your next item, Margaret. So this would be Danisco's update from the design subcommittee meeting. Okay. Um, it's a little echoey in here. Sorry. Um, we met in person on April 2nd, I believe. So a lot of that meeting was um, material samples that we bought, but we do have images and uh, some drawings that we used that were the foundation of the discussion. So uh, I'm going to share my screen and we can walk through those. One second. Um, starting with the exterior of the building, uh, it's going to look as many of you remember it the last time you saw it, but there are some fine tweaks, including the color of the window frames, the aluminum uh, mullions and curtain wall system. Um, we also had a good discussion about um, the extent of and finalizing the patterning and coloring of the masonry materials. Um, this is all going to look very similar to as you've seen. We did have samples of some of uh, a full board of the main field colors and then some representative samples of the masonry accent panels, um, which will be custom colors. So uh, we will and are working on getting some finalized samples of that for the committee to look at and review. Uh, one of the few things that we did talk about as we come around to the south side of the building um, we have some patterning uh, on the third floor mechanical room um, that doesn't relate to any windows as it does in the rest of the building. So we talked about maybe um, making that a little bit simple. And as the background, a uh, sort of discussion about letting what is simple be simple and let what is patterned point out. And then we also had some discussion about possibly changing some colors around the gym and decreasing the contrast of this uh, perimeter band that you see here. Uh, I will note that all of these materials are uh, from that presentation and have not been ref updated to um, inc incorporate those comments. Uh, we've been busy working on the 90% drawings and then with the next design meeting, we'll have come back with these uh, items. Um, all of these items that we're talking about on the exterior are essentially colors and patterns and so, uh, we have that scope captured for the 90% documents, and it's really a matter of finalizing the design. And then I'm going to show some drawings of the inside, too. One second. One of the things, I'll just make a comment while Tim's pulling it up. We met in the Port River School Library. And there were kids there and they were walking by looking at this stuff and they said, oh, gosh, that's really cool. <laughs> and so they, they were weighing in with their opinions. It was uh, great. Yeah, it was good to see the kids were pretty enthusiastic. So a lot of what we talked about on the inside of the building is the complexity and the extent of the different uh, materials and the patterns that will work with the inherent properties of the material. So the... Um, Flooring is a sheet good, uh, so you'll see that our um, pattern is sort of linear um, and not as granular as we would 
possibly do if it was a tile product. Um, we talked about the extent and the complexity of the pattern of the tile that we have um, as a wainscot in the corridor uh, for durability and to bring color through the building and how we've accented the vertical circulation with different tile patterns here where the pattern gets a little more concentrated. You're at the elevator. Um, how the different color palettes of the flooring, uh, the tile that is on the walls, the millwork that is in the project areas, all is working together. And after we go through some of these videos, there's some photographs of the material boards that I will uh, share. Uh, we also made some comments on the detailing of the project areas. You'll notice that one of the cubes in the millwork in the central area of the project area is open to the corridor. Uh, you know, after a little bit of discussion, we sort of came to the conclusion that it would be better if both of those cubes were closed as the one on the right is here just for acoustic and the way that it's imagined kids will actually use them and sit in them. But uh, we did discuss the general theme of having a color per floor, uh, multiple colors that sort of create a pattern and they, as you get to the vertical circulation elements, they would bleed together. Uh, there's a couple more videos. So here we are working through the lobby that shows, uh, again, uh, the sheet good linoleum flooring tile on the walls. There is also areas of wood paneling in the lobby. And then above that, there is acoustic wall treatment, all of which um, the sample boards, uh, we're trying to show the colors working together. And then this section just takes you through the building so you can see how the patterns relate to one each other, where they start, where they stop. Um, here you can see the tile wall in the south stair facing the bus drop off where the concentrations of color come together. And then again, looking south in the main corridor of the academic wing, you have a similar view of the project areas and the millwork that will be the focus areas for the cluster of classrooms. And then as you walk past uh, the multi-fixture toilet rooms, they are um, different colors than the floors, but color-coded within the toilets themselves so that the girls' room on each floor is the same color and the boys' room is the same all in the buildings. That sort of... We found that that helps uh, allay some confusion. It makes it clear. Let's leave it at that. And then uh, I'll also share some photos of... Uh, Deb, I see your hand up if you have a question for something that's on the screen. Happy to address it now. Um, can you just tell me what a vertical circulation element is? Oh, sorry. Sorry, that is a bad word that architects use to talk about stairs or elevators. And uh, some, uh, thank okay. you for reminding me that uh, we're talking to normal people. And, and uh, Thank you. Good point. No, just a uh, question, not a point. Thank you. Whoa. Um, so here, um, and the photographs don't do it justice and we don't have all the materials. The exterior uh, brick boards are, are large and unwieldy, but they were at the meeting and we will be bringing them back. But so this is a sample board that we like to make for each um, particular room in the building. It has the um, flooring colors across the top, the wall tile colors, paint colors, accent wood colors. Uh, this is a little bit dark and that is, uh, just want to uh, you know tell everybody where we are in the process. At 90%, we're very close to having things dialed in. We certainly have the extent of materials and the complexity of the patterns. Um, that is to say that the, there's still a little time for some tweaks in the final selections of the colors, but we we like to think we're almost there. And then I'm just going to go through these boards quickly that um, we had uh, a palette per floor, a green floor, 
a blue four uh, and an orange four. So here you can see the uh, actual colors of the materials as, as laid out. Jonathan. Um, well, I note that, uh, you know, that while you've come a long way, that the final, final selection doesn't really occur until after you have contractors in place. Um, because much of that this is true. competitively bid, and so we don't know that we have product A, B, or C quite yet. Mm -hmm. So yep, yep. Uh, to expand on that, we have to specify A, B, and C, and it is not uncommon that D is proposed. Um, and so we, we just have to, um, these products that we are putting before you are the basis of design. Uh, um, this is our intent. And, um, you know, if a contractor proposes a reasonable substitute that achieves our stated goals and the uh, specification, we generally have to comply. And then, you know, the reason that uh, we put all of these pallets next to each other so that if somebody does uh, propose a different tile, you know, we have to work with what that means for the other flooring products. The paint is pretty easy, but uh, this all works together. And uh, as Jonathan said, we don't get every piece. So we like to look at it all in, in concert. Yeah. And as Jonathan noticed, it is bid, but we do specify the colors that we'd like to use so that when we're evaluating that substitution uh, for manufacturer D and they have three colors and they're all brown, uh, they're not they're not an equal because they're not hitting all our buttons for all the colors that we told them we'd like to use. So we do that to kind of minimize the backtracking, you know, during the submittal process. Um, and then just one more video to share. Um, here we are coming into the lobby, just uh, none of the other views were sort of eye level. Um, linoleum on the floor, wood paneling, clear story glass high on the right. This is all items that you have seen, but we are working on, uh, you know, finalizing that palette and the color selections. Um, there will be at least a couple more uh, design meetings in the uh, final two months of the design process. And then as we get some medals, we will review them. But um, we just wanted to give you the ability to take a look as we are about to go out the door with the 90% set. Cafeteria looking north to the athletic fields. Wood paneling at the front and back, curtain wall to the north. Kathy. Uh, yeah, I just, Tim, when you come back around, Tammy's sharp eyes picked out a place to hide under the stairwell. And, and you said that when you do the design specs, you would close that off in some way. Um, yeah, so we're, we're seeing something that we saw a while ago mm -hmm that you're yep. going to be adjusting, correct? Yeah, it, absolutely. And as of today, um, if anyone cares to download and look at the documents that we sent to the cost estimators, there is a wall under that stair. So no one will be able to um, evade someone who's trying to uh, get them to a classroom under that stair. So uh, I see Paul's hand is also up. Yeah, just a couple questions. I you probably have addressed this at, on the um, cafeteria, gymnasium, or not, the cafeteria. Is there um, what kind of sound mitigation do you have in there? And also, is there? I can't tell if there's a curtain there or some other sort of thing like that. For the uh, stage. So there is a curtain at the stage. Hold on, let me come around so you can see. Um, okay. So there is a curtain that draws in front of the stage. What you cannot see clearly in this, there is also an operable partition that is a foot behind the front curtain at the mm -hmm. front of the stage opening, mm -hmm. um, which is a which has a 
STC sound transmission coefficient of about a, a normal wall. Um, mm -hmm. And that, are you concerned, just so I answer the right question, between the music programs that are beyond the stage or the corridor itself and uh, the cafeteria, which is a noisy space? Uh, the cafeteria itself. And if you anticipate that that curtain generally will be closed to help offset the noise or if that will be generally open. So there's a curtain at the back of the stage and on the mm -hmm. sides that will always be there to absorb sound. Um, the uh, We're using a high NRC ceiling. Um, and then there's also uh, another layer of acoustic treatment uh, to prevent sound transmission out of the um, cafeteria above the ceiling uh, to the spaces uh, above. So um, absolutely, the cafeteria is a noisy space. You have nearly 200 kids. Uh, mm -hmm excited uh and there are a lot of hard surfaces in the floor um and the and, glass uh, the, the glass to the mm -hmm. north but yeah. uh we do have the ceiling and the uh stage curtains to absorb as much as possible and okay. the glass to the corridor is a fairly good has a high sdc and the doors can close okay thank you uh deb and then bruce um i following up on paul's question that curtain it what's the lifetime of it like when will we need to replace it and how much would that cost that's what i was thinking too dead <laughs> i'm sorry the, the same thing i was thinking the same thing yeah Uh, that is an excellent question. That is a very durable curtain material. Rick, I, if, if we've, I, I don't know that we've ever replaced it. We've never, most, the, let me, how do I put this? Most of the existing schools that we go through that have platform stages with curtains still are using their curtains decades on. It doesn't mean that the next renovation, they don't want to replace them, but they do have a very long life and they can be cleaned. And we've been told anecdotally when we've looked at auditoriums and schools that, that, oh, we had the curtain cleaned, you know, X years ago. And, and they remember that because in those applications, when it's a full fly stage, that curtain is uh, fire rated but in this situation it is not uh, we do not have to have a fire rated proscenium curtain on a plant elementary school platform so it's mostly functioning just for uh, productions and uh, and the like okay so that sounds great cleaning cost estimated I no, I have again because when I've heard that anecdotally, it was several years ago, and it had to, and it was the fire rated ones, which is a different situation, so it wouldn't be a, applicable. Okay, Bruce. Then, oh, sorry, Deb, keep going. Come back to me. It's okay. No, that's okay. Why? Why you're here? Um, bathrooms. I yeah. I I haven't gotten up to speed entirely on the project. I heard you say boys and girls. Is there a gendered signage on them? On um, there is signage on the bathrooms. There is. Uh, I should uh, opposite each multi fixture student toilet room in the academic wing. There is also a gender neutral toilet. So the the full. Um, complement of facilities is there. Okay, thank you. And and just to kind of expand on that, um, we haven't completed the signage package, right? As far as what the look of the gender neutral bathroom will look like, um, it also has it's also accessible. So we'll be going through that with um, school department, probably Rupert, just to standardize some some communities actually have standards that they want to see how do you depict that it's a gender neutral bathroom what is your wheelchair accessible image look like right thank you bruce um tim you mentioned that the, the uh, ceiling and the high nrc uh, which i guess we should say noise uh, reduction coefficient but 
I, I, I think I probably know that this we're good here, but typically, uh, you know, acoustic tiles, so called, are, are not always the, the most uh, uh, noise reduction, uh, 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 noise sound absorbent as possible. But this is, you said, a high NRC, so this is probably you know, uh, above an, a, a conventional acoustic tile and will do a, a more robust job of dampening the sound. Uh, what, what, for example, is the NRC rating? Is it up in the uh, 0.9 or something like that? Uh, yeah, I believe it's a 0.95. Uh, the, well, the, 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 when we use it in the cafeteria, it's, it's actually very high. It's the uh, Armstrong multiple. I also like to add that we re re review these acoustic separations and materials with our acoustic consultant as we as we work the space. And he's actually trained as a mechanical engineer, so he he looks at the air movement uh, sounds, et cetera, in these in these spaces as well. That's that's very reassuring. Uh, most of the uh, the the uh, I know when we did the previous elementary school uh, building committee, we were meeting in school uh, meeting rooms, and the noise from the mechanical system made it rather difficult for people who had any hearing impediment to hear. So, eliminating mechanical noises from these buildings is going to be a wonderful thing. I think. I don't see any of the hands, Tim, so you can continue our journey. Our journey, um, <laughs> unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your point of view, is uh, complete. Well, as far as the last design subcommittee meeting goes. And what Margaret has offered, but um, Tim sent me a link to these clips we've just seen. And after today's meeting, but if to extend any change, we'll figure out a way of getting them into snapshots. So if people want to share some of what you're seeing here, there'll be a way of doing it. The videos take up a lot of space um, and aren't easily either downloadable or uploadable, but we'll, we'll create something that's more a set of charts um, and snapshots. Deb? Um. I've been meaning to ask this all along and I couldn't figure out a good place to do it but in the meetings that I've attended. The, the In the cafeteria, is there, will we continue to be using disposable um, dishes? Um, there's an element of that that is operations, but we are providing a dishwasher and a dish return tray. Uh, so we have the um, capability for them to be using um, reusable trays, dishes, and stuff like that, which we don't always include. So they are set up to not be fully disposable, but that's also an operations question. Exactly. Yep. Good to you, Jim. So, Margaret, you're muted. Sorry. The next item we were going to talk about, um, I'm going to look to Rick to give us an update, is a discussion we've had in the last few weeks about potential procure early procurement of some very long lead items that could affect the overall schedule. So, Rick, take it away. Sure. Um, as a design team, uh, we've been speaking with Margaret's group and Bob Parent and uh, our consultant teams are working on other projects and talking with subcontractors and suppliers. Uh, we found that lead times uh, continue to be very, very long for emergency generators and switch gear um, to the point where uh, we feel that to mitigate any possible uh, delay in the overall completion of the building, uh, that it's would be worthwhile for the town to procure the generator in advance 
of going out to bid as well as the uh, main electric room switch gear. Uh, there are possibly workarounds for a generator, uh, but the switch gear can be a particularly painful delay on the overall completion of the building because general contractors typically do not want to uh, complete all the finishes in the building uh, and do the painting and every, and all the final finishing under artificial light uh, under temporary lighting. So not having permanent power in the building can tend to delay everything that comes after that. So there are a couple of the documents that we would use to procure that would be the 90% documents that we're uploading today. There are, there is a, you've probably heard reference to state contract for FF&E and, and equipment purchasing. There is a contract called SourceWell that Amherst is a member of that uh, the generators could be procured through. And that uh, process would be to go directly to the uh, generator uh, uh, suppliers for Kohler and Caterpillar and, and other equipments and ask them for a quote and to lock them into a delivery time. For the switch gear, that's typically purpose built and that would fall under a more typical goods and services uh, procurement through the town. Uh, we've reached out to some uh, uh, switchgear supply houses, and we've uh, Bob's gotten us a copy of the town's typical good and, goods and services contract, and we're starting to look at how that could go. It would be possible to um, solicit quotes for the generator at roughly uh, two weeks from this coming Monday. And the switch gear could possibly go out for bidding, publicly advertised bidding under goods and services uh, procurement uh, four weeks from this coming Monday. And that would shave uh, three to four months off some of the more draconian delivery times that we've received. And uh, we've all talked about ways of mitigating potential risks by having these procured uh, outside of the electrical subcontract. And there are ways to certainly minimize that. But I think the schedule, given we've got a school project and schools tend to open the same time every year, uh, ideally doing uh, these separate procurements would be beneficial uh, to the success of opening on time. Any questions? Uh, well, um, my main question, Rick, and I see Bob is also has joined us, Bob Parent. Um, this is something you're going to work out with the town, um, whether the town agrees to do, that it's a good idea and agrees mm -hmm. the way to do it. And so you're giving us a heads up. I mean, the, Correct. you know, the, as I understand it, otherwise we put um, the risk, the school will not open, will not likely open on time, given what you're hearing on the, the pipeline issues. Well, it's a it's a it's a risk management strategy. This right. is that's uh, what I'm hearing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And uh, I will say I didn't put it on the procurement schedule, but you will see it on the procurement schedule next month. And we, the team, so Danisco, Bob, Ksenia, and myself have discussed this with the electrical engineer, and we do think it's an appropriate risk management strategy. So um, more to come. Jonathan, you had a question. Uh, half question, half kind of comment. Um, and certainly, this uh, 
uh, makes sense from what we're seeing in our practice. Um, these these items are are problematic at the moment, to say the least. Um, and the the question half of it is uh, is is there a similar concern about uh, the transformer? Presumably, the utility is providing the transformer, um, and you know. I don't know if you guys have any more magical ways than I do when it comes to kind of locking in the utility to actually provide that. Because if there, we don't get a transformer, <laughs> all that there, stuff we plug into it won't do as much good. So the the story that we've been getting from Eversource has been we have been instructed to tell you that you will not get your transformer for I think it's up to 30 months after you tell us you're ready for it. That being that being said, when you drill them down, uh, they seem to be under just in time delivery, and there is no anecdotal evidence of anybody having been severely impacted by Eversource not delivering a transformer when it worked for the project. But that said. Their mantra is, we've been instructed to tell you it's it's months in advance. Uh, we have worked out with their electrical engineer a suggestion as to worst case how to deal with that. And we've talked about there's a uh, Eversource in Western Mass uses a uh, vault under their transformer. They actually require the uh, electrical subcontractor to pull the secondaries into that vault before they drop the transformer on it. And we could take advantage of that by building a metal box over that and providing for renting a uh, temporary generator to provide whatever power might be needed for that. And we think the way to do that would not to be, not to throw money at it during bidding, uh, but do it as a as a change order. Because if you throw money in into bidding um, and you don't need it, then you're trying to get 10 cents on the dollar back as a credit. Whereas you have a little more control when when you're negotiating a, a fixed price as a as a change when you get there. So that's how we think we're going to deal with that. Senya, because Senya has. So we have all in in the industry been building buildings through the pandemic. Um, these are not new issues. We've done projects, I've done projects that have required going to that extent, you know, renting a generator and running an active school off that generator that does not sit well with, you know, envir the environmental goals of this project. It is quite costly. It's subject to interruption. There's risks and it is not anybody's first choice. And, and we are not right now in our discussions advising pursuing that course in advance just in case, especially because the messaging out of the utilities, all of them, is on one hand officially very dire and anecdotally much less so. Um, if it comes to such a situation, there will be prior discussions in, you know, with this group um, and among the team. We are just looking ahead at this point to make sure that if it happened, we're not making it harder on ourselves to implement that strategy or more expensive or having to take apart work that's in place just to put in something that accommodates a temporary generator. So we're doing, you know, we're, we're looking ahead and preparing for all possibilities but have no desire or intention to jump on the direst or priciest ones. Okay, I don't see any hands up and I'm trying to stick to my promise on getting you out of here relatively early. The next item on the agenda is invoices. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ksenia and then we will go to public comment. And we do need, as you know, we do need to take a vote 
um, you need to take a vote on the invoices and they're coming to you as reviewed and recommended by answer. I'm opening up my screen. Can you see this? Okay, so I'm going to start and uh, going forward with putting the invoice package you're about to see in perspective. This is the first month we are paying for construction, for real construction, um, being the site work. And it is a substantial package. It is just over a million dollars. In perspective, however, what this graphic represents is from zero to here, um, 99 million is the total value of a project. The green bit, maybe I should zoom in a little bit more there. The green bit is the invoices that have been paid already. The black bit is the current invoice package, which is just over a million dollars. The yellow section is how much is left to pay on the contracts that are already committed, right? So that include the early site package, design, and OPM services, which, you know, those services do cover the entire construction period. And then the rest of this um, is the road to the finish. <laughs> I appreciated this particular hatching. Um, and so this is the piece, this little black piece that we'll be looking at, although it is quite more substantial than previous packages. The summary of a package looks like this. Let's see, all of it is one, two, th so one invoice for the OPM, two for designers, two monthly recs for, um, the early site package contractor, Gaglia Ducci, um, one tiny invoice for allied testing, which is the um, quality in construction testing uh, contractor that is agency that is employed directly by the town, so third party uh, testing, and uh, a small invoice from the DPW for striping the parking lot. Um, in the opposite direction. The, all of these invoices have been reviewed, negotiated, revised, and come to you ready for payment, and we recommend them for approval. Um, the total is $1,029,043.37. The answer advisory invoice is 53,000. I will flip through each one in detail um, in a minute. Uh, the Danisco invoices, there's a substantial one for progressing the design of the construction documents and a very small one at 3,000 for uh, supplemental geotechnical services um, under a pre-existing uh, expense allowance. The two Gaglia Ducci requisitions, a requisition is the construction term for an invoice, um, are for March and April. The way that construction requisitions are usually done is you do them in the third week of a month and you project for the last week based on uh, reasonable um, judgment of the team. And this month, it just so happened that we were able to sneak in the April one before we ever had an ASBC meeting to review the March one uh, because the April break, um, spring break, uh, pushed this meeting a little later than normal. So here you've got two months worth. Um, it is a 27 percent progression on the early site package. Uh, and this is the first time they're getting paid. They've been out there for a while now. Um, allied testing is, they're out there actively now, but this is just their March billing, which was just the meeting, um, just getting started. And the striping work by the DPW was $3,300. Uh, any questions before I go into flipping through um, the pages. Hearing none. And again, stop me anytime you want to look more. The answer advisory invoice. Staff notes of what we do every day. Dear diary. The Denisco invoice for the design progression at uh, 331500 the smaller Denisco invoice for geotechnical services. Um, this is the March requisition. I should probably zoom in because it looks so 
So the this is um, because this is the first construction uh, requisition. I'll just pause here for a second. Um, uh, construction requisitions get notarized by the contractor and the final version gets signed and authorized by the architect. Um, there is the concept of retainage being held. That means that of the amount that we recognize as earned, we hold back 5% to give them incentive to come back and finish any punch list work at the end. Um, and they provide a partial waiver of lien so that they are not able to come back and place the lien on the property that you've paid for. Um, this is the second requisition for April. Again, I'll zoom in so it's a little bit more visible. Bottom lines. Happy to pause and delve deeper if anybody would like the $200 um, LI testing invoice uh, and the DPW invoice for striping. So I'll just rest it on the front page. Um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to go deeper. Otherwise, Kathy, it's all yours. I move to approve the invoices as presented. Second. That was Doug. Thank you. Um, Kathy, do you want me to call the roll or you, will you do that? Uh, I'll call the roll. I just want to make a quick comment. Ksenia, I liked very much that bar you showed at the very beginning that gives us a sense of how much we've paid, how much is coming due. I think it's a, a helpful tracking device. So okay. I, will, I will go through um, to get to get the vote. Uh, Paul? Yes. Uh, Jennifer? Yes. Bruce? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Donna? Yes. Doug? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Rupert? That's yes. Alicia. Yes. And Kathy is a yes. It's unanimous. With um, Ksenia, there's three absent, Allison, Simone, and Angelica. OK. So are there any questions or comments before we go to public comments? And people have, by now, I think Margaret has put a hold on people's calendars for the June, July, and the May, June, July, and August meetings. Um, and, you know, Deb, whatever is occurring, we can try to iron it out with, you know, it's on your calendar, but somehow you're not getting the notices. So, um, so if there are questions in between or there are materials that um, you want to more more of what we've just shown, such as the images, just email me um, and I'll make sure I can get feedback on them. So hey, I just want to say I, I think it's not on Angela. I think this is about other Internet issues. Yeah, no, I I mean. It, the, the other people who are on our Zoom, you just get these repeat notices, you know, the day before, the, an hour before. So we'll, okay. we'll figure out since my emails are going through to you. Yeah. So we're open for public comments at this point. Maria, I have allowed you to talk. Thank you. Um, First of all, think this it's looking lovely. Thank you for, for the update. Um, I wanted to just bring up one issue that I'd brought up in the past, and, and I just don't know whether it's resolved yet for the 90%. So you will not be surprised that I'm still interested in making sure that there's a backstop for the softball field so that cars don't get hit with foul balls. Um, so um, if you could check on that, make sure that we've got a backstop for the softball field so that we can actually play softball there and, and the kids can play softball. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is how much I appreciate you guys. Um, it seems like it should go without saying, but that you continue to meet, that you um, continue to vote on invoices that Ksenia, you gave um, a lot of information there. Um, 
it, this is in stark contrast to another project in town. So very much appreciated that this committee and the designers and the, the OPM and the committee is continuing to, to keep a close eye on this project and to do great work and to, um, uh, to conduct yourselves publicly so that we can see that. I did have just one uh, question about the invoice and maybe it makes sense, but it seemed odd to me to pay the DPW $3,000 to line the parking lot. So if somebody could explain that to me, either here or offline, why we're paying the town to, to stripe a parking lot for a town project, that would be great. Uh, but thank you very much. And um, yeah, have a good day. So uh, we have another hand up. Rudy, I believe I brought you in. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thanks so much to the design team for anticipating these long lead headaches. I've I had struggled with that on projects of my own. And so I really love that you're figuring out a lot of backstopping and that's great. Um, I also agree with Maria. The design looks really nice. So. I, I just wonder if we could get the 90% documents that you're sending to the estimators posted in the packet pretty soon, because it's in some ways our last look at the project before it kind of gets set in concrete and steel, um, where comments might still be relevant. So if, if that can be done, that would be great. Um, I think a meeting or two ago, there was an explanation that we couldn't have the sustainability slash net zero subcommittee meeting yet because we didn't have the plug load report in. And um, I don't think I've missed those, but I wonder if the plug load report could get posted and we could have a uh, maybe the last sustainability meeting before there's an opportunity to make any substantial changes or changes, let's say. Um, so those two things would be helpful, I think, the plug load report and a sustainability subcommittee meeting. And I heard um, sort of offline that there were there's a new wrinkle potentially on the uh, Inflation Reduction Act 30 percent credits for the energy, um, you know, direct uh, subsidy. And I'm wondering at some point if that could be, um, if any updates on that, I understand there were some possible workarounds and I'm wondering where that issue has gone. Maybe it's still up in the air. Um, and this seems to be thanks to the IR, IRS changing its views on things. So um, anyway, thank you so much for all your work. Bye. Thank you, Rudy. So as always, we, we, we will record the public comments and to the extent there's additional information that we can provide, we will uh, during the next meeting. I just wanted to um, uh, report on one thing that during the design subcommittee meeting I reported on with M Margaret, we've been looking for and with um, the help of our consultants on net zero buildings, a an interactive video th that would, or a real-time video capacity that would show the energy use of the building, that would show how much energy has been generated by the panels that would be appropriate for the elementary school. And we found a few that have already been done. And it's it's the, it's been designed in a way that Sitting at home, I can look at this school in DC and see on a minute by minute basis what's going on. So we're we're doing some further exploration of that. So when Tim showed art on the walls, those are potential also an entry place where a visitor to the building could see this. And I had a very quick conversation with one of the colleges in town on could we design, de develop our own and have it be an in-kind gift to the school? And the initial answer was that might be wonderful. So it's it's something we can, it doesn't need to be incorporated in now because it it uses the information that the building itself generates. So it's, it's 
creating something for the kids, for the school, for the teachers that would, I think, be pretty exciting as a climate action building. The Kern building in town has one of these. I mean, we have some examples of them. So people were searching for already in use. Um, so I just want to let the larger group know about this. There's nothing more that I can say than we've found a few, um, thanks to some research that Margaret uh, did with then Sh Shelley and Jacob, who are our, uh, over on the net zero and sustainability side. So I'm not, I don't see uh, root, uh, I don't see any other um, comments by the group. So I think if I don't see any last minute hands go up, uh, we adhered to our promise of a shorter than posted meeting. And we can adjourn, but we're we have a new practice in town where we're taking a vote to adjourn. So there's no doubt that there was agreement that we're adjourning. So I'm moving that we adjourn. Do I hear second. a second? And I'll go quickly around the room. Kathy say yes. Paul? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Bruce? Yep. Deb? Yes. Doug? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Jonathan? Yes. Rupert? Yes. Alicia? Yes. It's unanimous. And we are adjourned at whatever time it is. Thank you very much. 9.43. We'll see you on May 17th. Thank you. Bye, Thank everyone. You.